My name is Rebecca, and I'm an artist. Not the kind you see in fancy galleries, but the kind who spends her days in a modest charity center, painting with kids who've seen more than they should. I've always believed that art can heal, and every day I see it happen with these children. I live with my husband, Mark, a sales manager who's always chasing the next big deal, and his mother, Martha, who's never seen a reason to hold back her opinion. Our home is a constant buzz of Mark's phone calls and Martha's TV shows. It's not easy, but it's life. One evening as I was preparing dinner, I decided to share some exciting news. Mark, Martha, I entered some of my paintings and the kids' artwork in a city contest. The prize is $100,000. Mark, scrolling through his phone, didn't even look up. That's nice, Rebecca, but let's be real. What are the chances? Martha snorted. With those street kids' drawings, you're dreaming, dear. I try to explain, it's not just about the prize. It's about showing what these kids can do, how they express themselves. Mark cut me off, Rebecca, why don't you find a real job, something that actually pays? I sighed, looking at my half-chopped vegetables. It's important to me, Mark. This job, these kids, they matter. Moreover, my salary at the center is quite enough to pay bills and food. Martha waved a dismissive hand. We need real money, Rebecca, not child's play. I finished dinner in silence that night. As I lay in bed, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and disappointment. I believed in my dream in the magic of art, and maybe, just maybe, the contest could be a new beginning. But at home, it felt like my dreams were nothing but whispers in a storm. I closed my eyes, picturing the colorful, chaotic art room at the center, the place where my heart felt fullest. Tomorrow, I'd go back there, to my little haven of paints and smiles, away from the doubts and the cold reality of my home life. This contest, it was more than a chance for money. It was a chance to prove to myself, and maybe to Mark and Martha, that what I do is valuable, that it has the power to change lives. And with that thought, I drifted off to sleep, dreaming of vibrant colors and the sound of children's laughter. Each day at the Cherry Center was a journey into a world where paint and canvas became tools of transformation. There, surrounded by children who had seen the darker side of life, I found my purpose. We painted murals together, walls turned into vibrant stories of hope, each brush stroke a testament to their resilience. I remember one afternoon, a shy little boy named Timmy, who had never picked up a brush before, created a bright sun with rays stretching across the wall. His smile as he stepped back to admire his work was brighter than the sun he painted. Moments like these were my daily reminders of why I did what I did. But at home, the story was starkly different. One evening I returned home, still carrying the joy of the day's achievements, eager to share. I approached Mark and Martha in the living room. Mark, look at this, I said, showing him a picture of the mural Timmy painted. This son, he's never drawn anything before. Mark glanced at the photo and then back at his phone. That's nice, but it's just a drawing, Rebecca. Kids doodle all the time. Frustration welled up inside me. It's not just a doodle, Mark. It's a big step for him. He's been through so much, Martha cut in sharply. Rebecca, when will you stop playing therapist with paint? It's a child's drawing, nothing more. You need to start living in the real world. Her words felt like a slap. It's not just playing, Martha. These kids, they find a voice through their art. It's healing for them, I insisted. Mark let out an exasperated sigh. Healing? What about our mortgage, Rebecca? Your healing isn't going to cover it. You need a real job. I clenched my fists, trying to control the rising tide of anger and hurt. This is a real job, Mark. It's making a difference. Martha snorted. Difference. What difference does it make when I'm ashamed to tell my friends where you work? You need to wake up and see reality, Rebecca, Mark said firmly. I stood there, words failing me. The gap between my world at the center and my world at home had never felt so fast. In one, I was helping to rebuild lives. In the other, 
I was constantly reminded of my supposed inadequacy. That night, in the solitude of my studio, I stared at the blank canvas. The harsh words from earlier echoed in my mind, drowning out the laughter and joy of the day. I picked up my brush, and with each stroke, I tried to paint away the hurt, the doubt, and the feeling of being undervalued. The day was winding down at the charity center, the walls echoing with the lingering laughter of children. I was cleaning up the paints when my phone rang, displaying an unfamiliar number. Hello, Rebecca Thompson speaking, I answered. Miss Thompson, this is John Harris from the City Arts Council. Congratulations, you've won our citywide art contest. The prize is $100,000. We'll be in touch soon for further details and to discuss an additional opportunity to collaborate with the city. The news hit me like a wave. I won. My voice trembled with a mix of shock and joy. Yes, indeed, you and the children's work truly stood out, John replied, his voice warm with genuine admiration. I thanked him profusely and hung up. My heart was racing. This was beyond my wildest dreams, a validation of our efforts, of the children's talent, and in some way of my own. I shared the news with the children, and their reaction was heartwarming. Their cheers and claps filled the room with an energy that was almost tangible. This was our collective victory. Later, as the center quieted down, I sat with Lisa, the psychologist, over a cup of tea. I shared my apprehensions about breaking the news at home. Mark and his mother have never really seen the value in what I do. They might just see the money, I confided. Lisa leaned forward, her eyes thoughtful. Why not test their reaction? See if this win changes their attitude. It might reveal their true colors. Her suggestion struck a chord. At home, my work had always been trivialized, its impact constantly undermined. This significant recognition could indeed be the litmus test for their genuine sentiments. I pondered over Lisa's advice as I made my way home. The idea was both unsettling and necessary. If the money swayed their attitudes, it would uncover the uncomfortable truth about their regard for me and my work. Stepping into the house that evening, I decided to hold off on sharing the news just yet. I wanted to observe to plan my approach carefully. Lisa's words echoed in my mind, and I knew she was right. It was time to find out the truth, however uncomfortable it might be. I went to bed that night with a mix of anticipation and apprehension. I was sure of Mark's love, or at least I wanted to be. But Lisa's proposal was an opportunity to see beyond my hopes, to understand the reality of my home life. I agreed with her. It was a test worth taking. That evening, I decided it was time to put my plan into action. Sitting at the dinner table with Mark and Martha, I took a deep breath and said, I have something to tell you. I won the city art contest. The prize is $100,000. The reaction was immediate and dramatic. Mark's fork dropped to his plate with a clatter and Martha's eyes widened in disbelief. $100,000, Rebecca, that's incredible. Mark exclaimed, his usual indifference replaced by surprising enthusiasm. Martha, who had always been quick with a critical word about my job, suddenly softened. Dear, that's wonderful news. We're so proud of you, she said, her tone unusually warm. During the meal, Martha fussed over me more than she ever had, offering me the best pieces of chicken and constantly refilling my glass. Mark, too, was uncharacteristically attentive, asking about my artwork and the contest in detail. Their newfound affection was overwhelming, almost suffocating. I noticed them exchanging glances, a silent communication that I couldn't decipher. It was as if a switch had been flipped and the usual cold, dismissive atmosphere had transformed into one of exaggerated warmth and interest. Later that evening, I stepped out of my room to get a glass of water and overheard a hushed conversation coming from the living room. Curiosity got the better of me, and I quietly moved closer. We can finally redo the kitchen like we wanted. I heard Martha say in a hushed tone, and get that new car, we deserve it, after all, Mark added, his voice laced with greed. There was a pause before Martha spoke again. 
Once we have the money, we can think about, well, Rebecca doesn't really need to stay here anymore, does she? My heart sank as I listened. Their words were like daggers, revealing their true intentions. The affectionate dinner wasn't for me. It was for the money. They were already planning to spend my winnings on themselves and even discussing getting rid of me. I quietly retreated to my room, their words echoing in my ears. The test had revealed their true colors, and they were darker than I had imagined. I lay in bed, a mix of hurt and clarity washing over me. This was not the love and support of a family. It was opportunism, plain and simple. As I closed my eyes, the weight of their betrayal pressed heavily on my heart. The truth was out, and now I had to decide what to do with it. The morning air was tense as I sat down for breakfast with Mark and Martha. The news I was about to break would surely stir the pot, but I was determined to see it through. Casually, I started. I've decided what to do with the contest money. They both perked up, leaning in with a keen interest that had been absent before. I'm donating the entire $100,000 to the charity center, I said, watching their faces for reaction. The response was immediate and explosive. What? Mark slammed his hand on the table, his face red with anger. Are you out of your mind, Rebecca? Martha's voice was shrill, filled with disbelief and outrage. You're giving away our ticket to a comfortable life, you foolish girl. I remained calm, though their words stung. It's not our money, it's mine, and those kids need it more than we do, I explained. Mark's voice was laced with scorn. This is the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. You're a fool, Rebecca. Martha's anger bubbled over, her words harsh and unfiltered. You've always been a disgrace, pretending to be some saint with those street kids. And now this, throwing away a fortune. I tried to explain, it's not throwing it away. It's helping children who have nothing. But Mark was relentless. It's not just about the money. You've always been this way, naive and foolish. I should have seen it sooner. I was planning to wait, spend the money first, but now. Now I want to divorce Rebecca. I can't be with someone who throws away opportunities like this. His words cut through me, but they also brought clarity. This was the reality of our marriage, stripped of any pretense. I looked at them both, my decision firm. If that's how you feel, that it's clear to me now. This marriage, this relationship, was never about us. It was about convenience, about money. Without another word, I stood up and walked away from the table, away from the vitriol and greed. Their shouts and insults followed me, but they no longer had the power to hurt me. I had seen the truth, and it had set me free. The days following my announcement were cold and quiet. The house felt more like a battleground than a home. Mark and Martha avoided me, their disappointment and anger hanging in the air like a thick fog. I was packing some of my belongings in the bedroom when Mark walked in, his face hard, his eyes void of the warmth I once knew. So, you're really doing this? Throwing away our life for some charity? He asked, his voice edged with bitterness. I'm not throwing away our life, Mark. I'm choosing to do what's right with my money. I replied, folding a sweater into my suitcase. He let out a harsh laugh. Your money? It was supposed to be our ticket out of here, Rebecca, and you just gave it away like it was nothing. It was never about the money for me, Mark. It's about helping those kids, something you never understood. His frustration boiled over. You were so blinded by your so-called mission that you can't see the real world. You're a dreamer, Rebecca, and dreamers don't survive. I zipped up my suitcase, feeling the finality of the moment. Maybe that's the difference between us, Mark. I dream of making a difference while you dream of money, Mark's face tightened. You know what, Rebecca? Maybe it's better this way. I can't be with someone who doesn't see reality. I want a divorce. The words stung, but they didn't surprise me. If that's what you want, Mark, he turned to leave, then stopped. You were always a fool, Rebecca. I just didn't see it until now. After he left the room, I sat on the edge of the bed, the weight of his words sinking in the love. 
I thought the love we had was overshadowed by greed and misunderstanding. As I carried my suitcase downstairs, Martha didn't even look at me. Her disdain was clear, her silence louder than any words. Stepping out of the house, I felt a sense of relief mixed with sorrow. The chapter of my life with Mark and Martha had closed, but ahead of me was a path of my own making. I got into the taxi, glancing back at the house one last time. This wasn't just an end, it was a beginning. A beginning of a life where I could be true to myself and my dreams, free from the chains of greed and misunderstanding. The day to sign the divorce papers arrived with a mix of relief and finality. I walked into the lawyer's office feeling a sense of purpose. Mark was there, and to my surprise, Martha accompanied him. Their presence together was a stark reminder of the life I was leaving behind. As we sat down, Martha didn't waste any time. You're making a huge mistake, Rebecca, throwing away a marriage over some charity money. She kissed, her tone laced with disdain. And how do you plan to survive with your tiny salary? You can't even afford a decent place to live. She continued her words sharp and biting. Mark sat silently, casting contemptuous glances at me. I listened to Martha's tirade, feeling a strange detachment. Their words no longer had the power to hurt me. Once the paperwork was done and it was time to leave, I turned to them, a smile playing on my lips. You know, I was just testing you, I said, their confused looks fueling my confidence. Testing us, Mark echoed, puzzled. Yes, I wanted to see how you'd react if I said I was donating all the money and you both showed your true colors. Martha's face contorted in confusion. What are you saying? I'm not giving all the money to charity. That was a lie. And besides, they've given me several lucrative projects. I'm going to be just fine, I said, the satisfaction of revealing the truth making my words strong and clear. The color drained from Mark's face, and Martha's mouth hung open in shock. Their reaction was everything I had expected and more. Mark suddenly found his voice, desperation seeping through. Rebecca, please. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean any of it. Can we start over? I looked at him once my husband, now a stranger begging for a second chance. No, Mark, we can't. You show me who you really are, and I have no desire to be with someone like that. Turning to Martha, I added, and you, Martha, should know that money isn't everything. What I do, my work, it matters more than any luxury you crave. Without another word, I walked out of the office, leaving them behind in their shock and disbelief. I walked into the sunlight, feeling lighter and more confident than I had in years. The divorce was the end of a painful chapter, but it was also the beginning of something new. A chapter where I was the author of my own story, unburdened by others' greed and deception. It was a freedom hard-earned and well-deserved. The months following my separation from Mark and Martha unfolded like a series of vibrant brush strokes on a once blank canvas. I found myself immersed in a new rhythm of life. One that echoed with the sounds of children's laughter at the charity center and the quiet concentration of my work on city projects. My world, once confined to the expectations and criticisms of a household that didn't understand me, had expanded into a realm where my passion for art and my dedication to helping others were not just acknowledged but celebrated. I had rented a small apartment in a quaint part of town. It wasn't luxurious, but it was mine, a sanctuary where the walls were adorned with my paintings and the cheerful artwork of the children from the center. Each piece told a story, a reminder of the journey I had embarked on and the lives that had intertwined with mine. The decision to donate half of my prize money to the charity center had set a series of unexpected events in motion. The local newspapers and community blogs picked up the story, intrigued by the artist who chose charity over personal gain. My phone began ringing with inquiries and offers. Local gallery owners, once indifferent, were now eager to showcase my work. My paintings, which had been a source of solace in my darkest times, were now being admired in well-lit galleries, appreciated by people who saw in them the same hope and beauty that I did. 
the city projects too brought a newfound recognition. I was commissioned to design murals for public spaces, transforming bland walls into tapestries of color and life. Each project was a new adventure, an opportunity to leave a mark on the city that had become my larger canvas. In the midst of this newfound success, I occasionally received messages from Mark. His texts, laden with apologies and pleas for a second chance, were a stark reminder of the life I had left behind. I read them sometimes with a mocking smile, but mostly with a sense of detachment. The pain he had caused was a part of my past, a chapter that had closed the day I walked out of that house. His words once capable of cutting me deeply now seemed superficial, like ripples on the surface of a lake that could not disturb its depths. Evenings in my apartment were a time of reflection and creativity. I would often sit by the window, a cup of tea in hand, looking out at the city lights, thinking about the twists and turns my life had taken. The betrayal and hurt had been a crucible, burning away the illusions and leaving behind a clarity of purpose. I realized I had found strength in my vulnerability, courage in facing the unknown, and an unshakable belief in the power of art to heal and transform. On weekends, I conducted art workshops at the Charity Center. The children, each with their own story of resilience, continued to be my greatest inspiration. We painted together, our collective imagination turning blank canvases into expressions of joy, pain, and hope. I saw in their eyes the reflection of my own journey, a testament to the healing power of art. As the city embraced my work, my personal life too began to flourish in new ways. I made friends in the art community, a group of eclectic and supportive individuals who appreciated me for who I was. We shared stories, laughed, and dreamed together. For the first time in a long time, I felt a sense of belonging. One evening, as I finished a painting for an upcoming exhibition, I stepped back to take it all in. The vibrant colors on the canvas, the sense of accomplishment, the peace that filled my heart. It was a far cry from the days of doubt and belittlement. I had emerged from the shadows of a stifling relationship into the light of self-discovery and fulfillment. As I closed the lights that night and settled into bed, I thought about the future. It was unwritten, full of unknowns, but I was no longer afraid. I had weathered the storm and found my rainbow on the other side. My story was one of transformation, a reminder that even in our darkest moments, there is the potential for a masterpiece and I was just getting started.